everyone to the first <clears throat> webinar in our spring series for the Collaborative on Faith and Disabilities National Webinar Series. Uh, we, we plan to have one each uh, third Wednesday uh, of the month and welcome to our first one here in cold January. Our first webinar today is going to be is entitled How to Create Grassroots Change in Faith Communities, the Story and the Impact of Jewish Disability Awareness Month, and I will introduce the speakers in just a minute. Can we move this? The Collaborative on Faith and Disabilities, the, our vision and mission is to really to that people with disabilities and families will have compelling opportunities and supports to express their spirituality, engage in congregational life, and share their gifts and talents in ways that are valued and strengthen communities. Uh, we are trying to support people with disabilities, their families, and all those who are in various forms of spiritual and religious supports with, with them in relationship to research, education, service, um, and dissemination. Move ahead. The Collaborative has a number of partners that are university centers of excellence in developmental disabilities. We currently, in fact, have just opened up our membership and are beginning a membership campaign for the first time with voluntary dues that will support the work and the website of the Collaborative and help us do a number of things um, that we've not been able to because essentially it's been mostly on volunteer time and effort. But we are excited by this and we, you'll find more information about the new membership categories and the campaign on the website. But we have more than 14 university centers on the collaborative now. And we are opening it up to faith groups and seminaries and others as well. A few important notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted. So if you have friends who would like to see it after you see it, and we'll also advertise that, they can come back and see the archive version. The resources and links will be posted. If you are watching it now, please submit questions during the in the chat box for discussion after the presentations. And I'll, I'll read the questions to the presenters during that question and uh, answer period. We'll silence phone lines unless you're talking. Our, our time is brief and the presenters have a lot to do in a short time. And there will be some more information about upcoming webinars on the, on the uh, collaborative website and we'll share some briefly at the end. Please post your questions in the chat box as we go, go along. So it's my pleasure to introduce Shelley Christensen who's a colleague of mine uh, who, uh, and my uh, Jewish disability and faith expert who I go to, my go-to person, uh, who then connect, can connect me with multiple people in the Jewish community in, in the US and uh, Canada and increasingly overseas as well. Uh, she, along with colleagues Gabriel Kaplan from Philadelphia and Aaron Kaufman from Washington, I think is from Washington, will be leading the seminar to the webinar today. And, and Shelly is the organizer and really the moderator of it. So Shelly, welcome and thank you all for being with us. I think what happened, oh good, thank you, hi. I think what happened is um, we just had a little blip in our internet something. But anyway, it's great to be here. Bill, thank you for introducing us. And uh, Gabby Kaplan Mayer and Aaron Kaufman are joining us today. I'm so excited to talk about Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. And this is the 10th year that this totally volunteer organization, just like just like the um, collaborative is totally volunteer. Um, what we're going to talk about today is how, how we started Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. We call it JDAME. And 
it's we're going to address it from a global perspective so how a, a, a broad faith community can come together and raise awareness the impact of that why it's important and some of the programming that we do on a broad base on a broader basis and then uh, Gabby will talk about the work that she does in her home community of Philadelphia as she coordinates all the efforts there and Aaron will talk about the national advocacy piece, which has been part of Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month for nine years. And it's another really important element. So please feel free to write your questions, um, type your questions in. Hopefully we'll address a lot of those during, during the presentation, but if not, we'll have them during the call. And I also invite you to contact any one of us um, if you wanna just talk through how you can start something like Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. Well, 10 years ago, it doesn't seem like 10 years, we, we had our first Jewish Disability Awareness Month. It used to be just Jewish Disability Awareness Month with the unfortunate acronym of JDAM. And we changed the name about four years ago to Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month, hence we got the better acronym, JDAM. Um, it's, it just started, there is an organization uh, called the Jewish Special Education International Consortium, which was a group of special educators who met annually at a colloquium. And in 2008, when inclusion was really starting to appear on the radar in Jewish communities, and prior to that, special education was really the impetus, educating our youngest community members. And the just, the focus on what happens when people grow up, what happens when people are young, what happens in families, how do people maintain their connection to their faith community in meaning, personally meaningful ways. And that year, my colleague Lenore Lehman, who was uh, with the Partnership for Jewish Life and Learning in Washington, D.C. and Maryland at the time, uh, she, she approached me and she said, what do you think about having like one time of the year where all the Jewish communities could get together and have use that month to have conferences and we could take all of our good resources and put them together and we wouldn't have to think of ideas on our own for speakers and what to do and and what kind of what kind of programming we wanted to have and I thought that was a really good idea and Lenore and I presented it to our colleagues at our colloquium in uh, 2008. Everybody loved the idea. And then we started thinking, well, why would we just limit this to conferences? Maybe we could just with our consortium members in our various communities, within our own, within our own workload, why don't we just introduce this idea of raising awareness in the Jewish community and maybe have a community-wide event and let the synagogues and the other Jewish agencies know that this is an official designation of a month to raise awareness, simply to raise awareness. So the consortium just thought that was, was great. The first year in February of 2009, four or five communities got on board. And I think Philadelphia might have been one of them. I think Washington DC was one of them and Minneapolis was certainly one of them. And we, uh, just so you know, why did we choose February, one of the coldest, snowiest months of the year, is because in the Jewish calendar, a lot of holidays happen in the fall and in the spring. And we were all very, very busy with family things in those times of year. And a lot of our members were education specialists in their communities and they were getting ready for school in the fall and ending in the spring. So we chose February simply because it's a month when there's very little activity on the Jewish calendar. It was the only reason we chose February. Which is kind of funny now that I think about it because it's such a bad month for, for planning. But um, the, after the first year, we added two things. We added a mission statement and we added the logo that you see on your screen. The logo was designed by one of my colleagues, Janice Goldstein at Jewish Family and Children's Service of Minneapolis. And Janice and I talked about the idea of what would it look like to weave inclusion and weave 
people, the 20% of the, the population who are marginalized, left outside of the community, what does it look like when a community comes together? And this, this Star of David, the visual representation with the ribbons wound together, really has resonated. And so you'll see this, you'll see this icon everywhere. Um, it's available as a free download on the website that we maintain, www.jdame.org. The mission, and I want to share this with you, the mission is a worldwide united initiative for Jewish organizations to raise awareness and foster inclusion of people with disabilities and mental health conditions. JDAME is a call to action as we act in accordance with our Jewish values, honoring the gifts and strengths that each one of us possesses. And we actually base this on some text in, in a book, um, the Mishnah Sanhedrin, which is, and I want to read this quote to you too. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I think it's very, very applicable in, in any faith tradition. The quote is, a human being mints many coins from the same mold, but the Holy One, blessed be God, strikes us all from the mold of the first human, and each one of us is unique. Therefore, every single person is obligated to say the world was created for my sake. It presents a beautiful framework. So, and Courtney, next slide, please. How important is raising awareness? Oops, I guess not. Go back. Can you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Um, how important is raising awareness in educating congregations and faith communities about inclusion and belonging? And uh, our colleague, Dr. Eric Carter, who is uh, at Vanderbilt, and Courtney Taylor, also at Vanderbilt, did uh, did the research, Courtney's our colleague too, sorry, sorry Courtney. The, the, um, their team conducted some research in 2014, it was published in 2014, and asked parents of children with disabilities what faith communities could do to impact reducing the barriers to participation. And this is pretty striking and pretty telling. More than 70% of the parents in the survey noted that congregation-wide disability awareness would be helpful. And in the research process, they also learned that only 10% of the congregations offered this kind of support. So we know, and it was also illustrated in, the, in this study, that the barriers of knowledge and attitude are often the reason for a lack of inclusion. And when we educate the entire congregation about people with disabilities wanting to belong and contribute to the community, it can go a long way to raise awareness and create a culture that encourages participation by all of its members. And essentially what we're talking about here is not just raising awareness, but fostering inclusion, creating a month, a vehicle that's raised the awareness of the entire congregation, not just the choir, people who are in the loop, but people for whom this is not even on their radar. And then the rest of the year continuing the momentum through processes, through organizational structures, through personal person-centered thinking to, to really become what we call the house of prayer for all peoples. So you know how we started and I wanna just tell you a little bit about some of the local programming, or not local programming, but some of the, the ideas. On our website, you'll also find listings of, of strategies and different ideas that you can implement. Again, replicable in any faith community. You can tweak, you can riff, you can adapt them. Please use our website and, you know, and start building that capacity to raise awareness. One of the things that we talk about, um, we, all, we recommend that in congregations, that inclusion and supporting people with disabilities and mental health conditions is addressed from the pulpit. It's very important that the clergy are on board. And communities, and Gabby will talk about this even more, but within individual synagogues, there are programs. Uh, one synagogue here in Minneapolis has made two videos first one in 2009, the second one in 2016, that, that 
inform the congregation about inclusion and what they do. And those, those videos are very different. You can see the evolution over time of how this particular congregation has grown to be inclusive. So those are just some of the examples of, of things that we do. But I want to sh just share with you some of the national initiatives that go on. And remember, J I call it J-Dame Central. And you are looking behind me at J-Dame Central. This is my home office. <laughs> Where I, where I work. Um, and so we don't have staff, we have colleagues and volunteers and we have an amazing cadre of people for whom this is important and that's the grassroots nature of this. So if we can go to the next slide, I just wanna share with you a couple of the programs. The first one is Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month Reads or JDAME Reads. And this started in 2012, so we were just in our third year I've shown you all the books that we've used, every single book. Um, some years we've had two books. The first year was The Story of Beautiful Girl with Rachel Simon, and Rachel created a curriculum that we can use with this book that really focuses on the, on the faith-based values of the book. The other books, um, and I won't go through all of them, but they're here. You can... Um, go on our website and I'm pretty sure they're listed there. I just want to point out last year we had two amazing books, Ketchup is My Favorite Vegetable and um, by, Le by Leanne Cooperberg Carter and The Little Gate Crasher, The Life and Photos of Mace Bugen, which, which was written by our very own Gabby Kaplan Mayer about her uncle Mace and the amazing life that he led in a period of time in this country where people with disabilities were so marginalized and so relegated to living life on the fringes. And he had this amazing, amazing life. So uh, just great books, every one of them. Some of them have been made into movies too. So um, in front of the class, Life Animated, of course. So great movies. And the next, we have a children's reading program too. One of these books may really surprise you as something that we offer for children. We've been doing the children's reading program for about five or six years and we partner with an organization called PJ Library on some of our books. Um, by the way, the book for this year is called Lucky Broken Girl and it's a, it is a young adult book but we loved it so much we thought this is a good, a good read for adults as well. So that's, um, that is a fantastic book, and we're, we're seeing a lot of people picking that one up to read. Um, the two books this year, Spark, a book about thought. It's not about disability. It's a book about thought, and it's for young children. And uh, Esty Raskin, the author, is uh, just now publishing a coloring book to go along with it. So it engages children, young children, on a on a besides the book on more creative ways so they can think about how they think and about how other people think. And it's, it, we think that it's going to help eliminate some of the barriers. The second book is I have a question about death. Yep. We, um, it's written by a good friend of ours, Meredith Polsky. And she and her colleague, um, whose name I cannot read, but um, and I, I apologize. Um, they're writing a series of books for children with disabilities. I have a question. The woman's name is Arlene. Oh, thank you. <laughs> See, one of my disabilities, Arlene Gaines. It's also, a, a, it's a wonderful book. It, it is not just a book for children with autism or other special needs, as the cover says. It's really good in explaining death to other to any child. But it's a very concrete sort of book. It's beautifully written and illustrated. And we don't recommend picking it up and just, you know, oh, here's your bedtime reading, little honey. But it really is appropriate when children have questions about death. The new book, a new book is coming out next month. I have a question about divorce. So it's creating a whole category. And by featuring it, these books for JDAME, we're really hoping to ignite the, um, the community in a number of different ways. We also have a film festival. It's the JDAME Film Festival, and that's our next slide. JDAME Films have featured a great film called Praying with Lior, 
which is about 10 years old. That was one of our first films. Autism the Musical with Elaine Hall, Autistic License, uh, Wretches and Jabbers, several Israeli films. And the film this year, next slide, is called My Hero Brother. It's, a, it's an Israeli film, and what it is are siblings. Uh, one of the siblings has Down syndrome. It's a group of siblings, and, and one of the, the siblings has Down syndrome in the pairs, and one doesn't. And it's this trek that they go on to the Himalayas, and th they've done a beautiful job of catching the relationships, not only between the siblings, but between other, other people who are on this trip. I think it's really enlightening. At first, we were troubled by the title, My Hero Brother, because we, we thought, are what, people with disabilities heroes because they climb a mountain? And it's, it's not that. It's the Hebrew title. And uh, so they, w they didn't change it. So if we can get past the title, I'm, I'm not bothered by the title anymore, but if you can get past the title, it really is a remarkable film. It's very person-centered and just lovely. So um, we often provide study guides for the films. We have relationships with the directors, and they can come and speak in communities. And so it's a really good way, again, to bring the community together, people for whom this is not on their radar, and, and come together to learn more and, and really to understand why. And that's the big question to address. Why inclusion? Why supporting people with disabilities and mental health conditions is so important to the, the viability and to how our communities can really flourish beyond where they are today. So I'm going to turn this over to Gabby. And thank you. Thanks so much, Shelley. It was great to hear your perspective about the history and the breadth of the programming and the resources. And as Shelley mentioned, I direct an initiative in um, the Philadelphia Jewish community called Whole Community Inclusion. We're based at an agency called Jewish Learning Venture that provides training and supports um, across the Jewish community here. We have a large Jewish community in the greater Philadelphia area. We work with about 50 different synagogues um, across five counties. And we're working all year long on providing those congregations with the support they need to welcome and support all of their students, um, their families. We create um, programs in the community um, to provide education and support for families. And, um, and we also do a lot of advocacy and awareness work through the year. But we wanted to participate and be part of really shining a light on disability inclusion during JDAME, during February. And we've done a number of different things, but what we're doing right now, I'm really excited about and so glad that Shelly invited me here to share with you today. We have started something called JDAME, Shabbat Across Philadelphia, where we have invited every synagogue in the area to focus on disability inclusion at one of their services at any point um, in the month of February. We started this last year, and of course with a pilot year, you know, it's a little challenging to get people on board to explain what it is, what we want them to do. So we were really pleased that last year we had 10 synagogues participating. And now in our second year, I'm getting more, we have 15 on our list right now, and I think we may get up to 20 um, through the month. And they are synagogues from all different denominations of Judaism. And um, what we've asked them to do is, as I said, to dedicate their service in some way to disability inclusion. So it could be the rabbi giving a sermon during the service. It could be a panel of congregants who have disabilities getting to talk about their experience. It could be a speaker related to a topic um, that may be of concern about faith and the community, or it may be larger on advocacy issues. And um, I've helped connect speakers to different congregations. It's, it's really cool to see what's happening. 
some um, folks are sharing movies and discussions, book programs. Um, we have one synagogue that's doing a whole weekend with a scholar in residence. And so we estimate that with the number of synagogues participating and with the average amount of congregation, congregants who show up at the synagogue, that we're gonna reach at least 1,500 members of the community who are not personally touched by disability inclusion issues um, necessarily, but who will be there at their synagogue and will learn and have an experience. So we're really, we're really excited to see what the impact of this will be. Um, Courtney, you can share the next slide. In addition to that, during um, JDAME, we will have um, a gathering for clergy. This will be our fifth year doing that because we, we realize how important the role of the rabbi or the cantor is in, um, in raising issues and creating a culture of welcoming and support. And I found that um, our local rabbis are really hungry and receptive and want to talk about these issues and, and don't always know who to turn to. So we've brought together um, peers to really share their challenges and their successes. And we share resources with them. We share um, some kind of speaker who, who, can, um, who can give the rabbis some, something to take away. Um, the photo on this side, actually, the man standing right next to me, the second one from the left, is Father Ed, who is a local priest who's doing really amazing inclusion work in his parish. And so we, we had you know, an interfaith conversation last year where Father Ed shared some of what's working really well in his parish with um, the rabbi, some of you see there with Father Ed, and it was, it was a great conversation. We also create lesson plans that teachers can use in religious schools. Those are on our website, which is jewishlearningventure.org. Um, you can check them out. They're free to download, and they could be adapted for any faith community. We hold programs for families. We also have something really cool. It's an online expressive art gallery. Um, this year, the prompt for the gallery was, what would the world look like if we judged people? not on their appearances. And so we're encouraging families and kids and teachers to create some kind of art around that and then we showcase it online. You can also see that on our, um, on our website, jewishlearningventure.org. But for anyone who's interested in any parts of this um, initiative that we're doing, I am happy to share with you. And I think my email will be later um, in the presentation, but really um, so thankful to get to share with, with you all today. Courtney, you can move ahead. I think Aaron's up next. Can you hear me? Hello. Can yes. You. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank the incomparable Shelley Christensen for inviting me. Uh, we would not have Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month or so many things in the Jewish dis disability world without Shelley. So I, and it's an honor to know Gabby as well. She does amazing work in Philadelphia, I want to first address the fact that probably some of you are listening to this and you're not Jewish and you're saying, well, this is very interesting, but I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Muslim, so how does this apply to me? Well, let me tell you from personal experience, just from what I've heard from other families and friends of mine that also have CP, if you do not make an effort to include uh, people with disabilities, they're probably never gonna go to mass or never come to the mosque again. And you can say, oh, Aaron, that's hyperbole, but I've seen it happen. And you don't just lose the individual with a disability, the, the 
whole family of that individual just gets turned off by Catholicism or Islam or whatever it is because of that experience. So um, I think that that is very important. The other thing that I wanted to just briefly say is that I was talking to a rabbi not too long ago who said to me, well, it's very important, but the fact is that um, I have a small budget at, at my synagogue and people in the LGBTQ communities want money and Jews of color want money or uh, the elderly need stuff. So we just can't do a lot because we have so many people pining for a small pot. And what I said is respectfully, Rabbi, people with disabilities encomp encompass all of those categories. Uh, there are gays and lesbians, there are elderly Jews, there are uh, Jews of color. Uh, and in your faith, you could say there are um, Catholics of all those categories too. And so I think that we have to, um, I think that we have to um, answer, uh, really just re recognize that among us uh, me, me is all those categories. And I just want to briefly touch and then I'll get to my other portion. Oftentimes I hear, well, oh, Aaron, it's too expensive uh, for our church, for our synagogue, for our mosque to undertake this. Well, the fact of the matter is that um, most accommodations according to um, the United Nations are $500 or less, or they don't cost anything at all. Um, and as I said before, the cost of not including uh, people with disabilities is that you lose the whole family and they're turned off by religion. Um, but a lot of people, when they think of faith communities and advocacy, think of faith communities, advocacy on controversial, hot button, social issues. And that is not accurate. Uh, where I work, the Jewish Federations of North America, we have a whole portfolio uh, devoted to disability um, policy. And I'm a lobbyist, registered lobbyist on the Hill, and I advocate on behalf of the Jewish Federation system every single day. And we decided that to elevate uh, the needs and services of people with disabilities. Uh, we would, eight years ago, they said, we will have a Jewish Disability Advocacy Day where we will um, bring everybody together uh, one day a year on Capitol Hill and we will advocate on issues of importance to people with disabilities and their families. And even if you're not Jewish, I would encourage you to come because I would love to have a Presbyterian Disability Advocacy Day, or a Catholic Disability Advocacy Day, or a Muslim Disability Advocacy Day. Last year we had 180 people come, um, and we're hoping for even more this year. It's going to feature a panel of experts on what people with disabilities can expect in terms of policy as a result of the first year of the Trump administration and strategies that were successful and were not in the first year. We have a lunch where um, nine members of Congress are going to address the crowd, a bipartisan group. We have advocacy training, and then individuals with disabilities and their families will go to um, advocacy visits and meet with their members of Congress and talk about why this is important to them. Uh, and I will just highlight very briefly the two issues that we are going to highlight. Medicaid, uh, people with disabilities, um, pe many people without disabilities rather think that Medicaid is just an insurance card. But in fact, it is a lifeline for people with disabilities because Medicaid pays for personal, att uh, personal attendant care, meaning somebody to shower, shave, and dress, someone like my brother who is severely disabled. It pays for job coaching for him. It pays for, uh, also school systems are dependent on it because they pay, uh, because they use Medicaid dollars to hire uh, speech, occupational, and physical therapists. And 
it benefits people in parochial schools too because those therapists are required to work with people in parochial schools as well. But Congress came within one vote of enacting millions of dollars of cuts, uh, excuse me, billions, I wish it was only millions, and that would have caused providers to close and tremendous job loss. So we are fighting to make sure that that doesn't occur. And also a major issue for people with disabilities is employment. But in order to be employed, you have to um, have a solid educational foundation. And Congress said in 1975 that they would pay 40% of the cost of educating people with disabilities. But the challenge is that they are only paying 15.3% right now, which means that students with disabilities are not getting as much support as they could be if Congress was honoring its words. So next slide, please, Courtney. Um, so I hope that many of you will come to Jewish Disability Advocacy Day, that it's on your screen, because uh, 2017 demonstrated that, like never before, um, that programs and services for people with disabilities are at great risk. I also briefly want to say that part of my role at uh, the Jewish Federations of North America is that I serve on the Interfaith Disability Advocacy Coalition, where we get together periodically, members of all faiths, to talk about how uh, we can advocate on behalf of people with disabilities, because as religions, we sort of have a moral authority when it comes to fighting on behalf of people with disabilities and the most vulnerable in our various communities. I also serve as uh, the co-chair of the Jewish Disability Network, which is a co-chair of, um, which is, excuse me, uh, which I am, is a group of organizations that get together on a quarterly basis and we talk about issues that are public policy impacting people with disabilities and what our various organizations are doing to uh, fight on behalf of people with disabilities and help them reach their full potential. Then there's another group I am a part of called Hinenu, where the various streams of Judaism, Reform, Orthodox, Conservative, Reconstructionist, get together. And they, uh, we talk about how we can make our various synagogues more welcoming. And um, the, and that is really unique. I think it's one of the only venues where all four streams of Judaism get together. And it's on how to make our community, our streams of Judaism more welcoming to people with disabilities. Um, so uh, the, okay, to wrap up, I would just say that uh, interfaith work is imperative. That is why knowing that employment was a very vexing problem. Uh, the IDAC put together a guide called Putting Faith to Work. Um, and uh, I can get that to anyone who wants it on this webinar. Uh, but please, please come to Jewish Disability Advocacy Day. The registration fee is $100, but we will not turn anyone away. But this is a time like never before where we need to raise our voices. So thank you very much, Shelley. Thank you, Aaron. Also want to mention in Hinenu, the, what is so unique about this is that is that this is one issue that has brought uh, all the various streams in the Jewish community together, including including Chabad, and so it's um, Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, Reform Jews, Jews of all stripes and colors and practices that come together because essentially, and this is true for all of us, I think who who work in the field of, of uh, in faith-based work is that essentially we are people who are here to support other people to have access to the same things that we value in our lives because it also matters. 
to people who don't always have the opportunities to belong. So that's, yeah. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Gabby. Bill, back to you, I think. Ah, here we go. We have our email addresses here. Right, we'll leave that slide up so people can get your email addresses if they want to contact you. Um, Aaron, I was nice to know about the, the Jewish Disability Network. I'm not sure that I knew about that as one of the advocacy organizations. Um, Shelly, I'd like to, and if any, if you've got questions, anybody who's watching or listening, uh, would you put them up on the chat board? Uh, and I can, uh, the chat box, and we can share them with the speakers. I want to start where you just finished, Shelly and, and Aaron, is how did you manage to get all those branches of Judaism together? We don't have the similar kind of forum in the Christian community, I don't think. Uh, somewhat, but not really. Well, I think that uh, Shelly alluded to this. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Shelley alluded to this. Uh, there is a quite a bit of friction and uh, between the various streams of Judaism. Uh, but uh, they all believe in making um, making uh, their 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 movements more inclusive, in part because, the Torah, which is the Jewish Bible, speaks of B'Tselem Elohim, which means that we are all created in the image of God. And the other element that I think pushes people to the table, Bill, is that now the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has said that one in every 68 children born will have autism. And so you better be inclusive if you want to continue to fill your pews, given the prevalence of disabilities such as autism. And I think to, one of the, you know, this, this takes, it takes people energy and the driving force behind Hinenu is, was um, Rabbi Lynn Landsberg. And Lynn is the now retired uh, senior disability policy specialist at the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism. She just happened to be at Jewish Disability Advocacy Day and met someone who works in disability programming at the Orthodox Union. The program is called Yachad, which means in Hebrew, translates to English together. And the two of them started talking. And Lynn said, what if we got all the movements together, people who are involved in, in disability work, and got them all together and just sat down at a table and talked about what inclusion is and how we support different people. And without a whole big um, Megilla, a whole big, big thing, they brought in, they brought in the movements, um, the conservative movement and the Reconstructionist movement, Reform Jewish movement, the Orthodox movement and Chabad. And we, we were meeting once a year, and uh, we're kind of in a, in, a, in a holding pattern right now. But it really is, it was an accomplishment. And some of the things that came out of this, and I think this is what makes this, again, another grassroots opportunity to raise awareness, is that in Hinenu, we created a, a guide for congregations. And then each movement took that guide and put it into their own their own speak, so to speak. And, and, and then they posted it on their websites and promoted that. So it really, it was, it was a beautiful collaboration and uh, I, I'm sure it'll continue, um, but it's, it's just incredible. And I wanna give a shout out to Rabbi Lynn Landsberg because she's, she and is, has been my, one of my partners in this work for, 15 years, more than that. Thanks to you, Bill, who introduced us. I don't know <laughs> that. 2005. And, I, and we need people, we need people like Lynn, we need people like, like you, if you're here watching this. There are people in your community who live with disabilities whom the clock is ticking. And 
every day that goes by is a squandered opportunity to participate. And so that's, that's why we've got to step up, all of us, raise awareness, invite people with disabilities, and make them make sure that they're part and parcel of the conversation, part and parcel of all the things that we do that, in, that concern them. Well, I think that model is just very encouraging. And uh, one of the things, one of the webinars we're going to have later on uh, this, this spring in May, I believe, is the one with Karen Jackson from Eastern Virginia is going to talk about the faith inclusion network that's brought together people from multiple faith traditions, uh, including the different branches of Judaism in that area to work together around inclusion. But, uh, and, but it's, it's really nice to see that um, in operation and for us to say, hey, this is really possible. And I think your, your rationale for it and the, is uh, just right on. Um, I don't see any other questions up here at the moment. Let me ask, go back and ask you one that came up during the meeting. And I think you've answered it in some ways, but some uh, in, it is when somebody says to you, oh, I a uh, leader of a synagogue says to you, oh, I don't have the time or we don't have the money to do inclusion. How do you respond to that? Bill, I could jump in with that. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the factors that, you know, makes this work, um, you know, something that takes time and energy is that there's not a one size solution for all, right? right. right. So it depends on the community, but, um, you know, I really encourage, um, first of all, for the community to think about there are lots of changes that can be made that don't cost a lot of money. Um, sometimes there's a, an obstacle is just the belief that anything we do is going to cost money. I have one synagogue here in Philadelphia, I'll give you an example, where the rabbi discovered that there were four or five congregants who were in the process of retiring as educators. One was a special education teacher, one was an occupational therapist, one was a reading specialist, and the rabbi reached out to them. They, the school really needed some support because they were bringing in more kids who had learning challenges. And these congregants stepped up um, and they became a, a sort of a volunteer committee serving in the school. So sometimes there are resources there in the community that you just haven't thought about putting together. Um, there also can be a lot of energy around specific fundraising. So another congregation I've been working closely with in J their J Dame Shabbat service is going to unveil a Torah reading table that um, is specially designed for wheelchair users that is going to be on the floor of the sanctuary so that there's no barrier in terms of people who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices getting to it. And um, the cost of this particular table was around $6,000 and three congregants who wanted to memorialize loved ones made this gift together. So again, the rabbi knew that there were congregants looking to do something special to memorialize their loved ones. The synagogue had a need for a new Torah table that was accessible and it came together in that way. So I think sometimes we imagine that cost is going to be prohibitive and we have to really get creative in our thinking. That's Gabby, that's so interesting that you're talking about the reading desk, the Torah reading desk. Um, one of the, and it's, it's interesting because, and it's a great illustration because there's, there's one strategy, raising the money, inviting people to participate, to pay for something. Um, one congregation here in Minneapolis also wanted to have an accessible table. Um, and they looked at their budget and they said, well, what's the best way to do this that isn't going to cost us very much money. Interestingly enough, they somebody suggested going to um, a catalog for drafting tables, architectural drafting tables. And they found one that was the right height for wheelchair users. And they, um, they purchased it. It was $100. 
And it wasn't, and this was a congregation that years and years before had said, well, we can't modify anything because it'll ruin the architectural design of the building. And that culture shift, and then we call that a culture shift, mm -hmm. an attitudinal shift went from, okay, we like the look of our building and we're not going to, we're not going to touch that to how we know inclusion is important. We know people who use wheelchairs want to read Torah, just like people who don't use wheelchairs. It doesn't matter. How can we make that accommodation in a way that really works for them? That also is cost effective for the congregation. I'd like to answer Jennifer Ward's question, if I may, that she put in the chat box. Um, she writes, as a coordinator for you said that has not been involved in these efforts in the past, what is the best first step to getting around these efforts for all types of faiths in the spiritual communities? Well, Jennifer, I think the, the, the first thing that any congregation needs to do is to conduct a needs assessment. And my friend here in Washington, D.C., Lisa Handelman, has created a, uh, with the Jewish Federations of Greater Washington, has created an assessment toolkit. It's meant for synagogues, but it can be used for churches, mosques, temples, um, anything. Uh, because you want to see how, in fact, accessible you are programmatically, physically, etc. So I would um, go on the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington website, look at the assessment tool, also talk to any congregants in your place of religious affiliation, uh, because there's a doctrine in the disability rights movement, nothing about us without us. So I think... Um, it's a lot of discussion and it's a lot of, let's see where we are, because you may already have an automatic door and that's great. But wanna, that's yeah. why the assessment tool comes in handy. I wanna add something too, Jennifer, and, and the, just so you know that you're not the first person to, um, to ask this question. Bill and I have been talking about this for a long time. Um, Nancy Weiss, Steve Eidelman, and, and I have had that conversation as well. And this area of inclusion is, is really becoming more and more important as time goes on. There's a couple of different avenues. I agree with Aaron. I think congregational assessment is really important. That's one side of it, but it's, it's much more complex than that. And I think you said could take a great role in leadership. We um, worked with Steve and Nancy at the University of Delaware to develop the Jewish Leadership Institute on Disabilities and Inclusion, very much similar to the Leadership Institute that they already have. It, it recognizes the fact that, that people don't really acknowledge that leadership is a critical aspect of inclusion and whether it's in a, a large national organization or in a congregation or local organizations, it's absolutely the, the, the tools that a person gains from leadership training particular to this field, particular to faith, spirituality, religion, disability inclusion is really, really critical. That's number one. Number two, look at what you already do well. Um, well, I, I have to go in a minute, but also I just wanted to read it out because some of us are having a difficult time. You see the question apparently, when Shelley's finished, this question is for you, Bill. It's from David Withrow. Models like MCC's Supportive Care and Congregation and our Star Raft model for building circles of support are fundamentally, uh, are fundamentally congregant based and no cost. So he just had that comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if people don't, what he, to, to spell out the acronym there, the, the MCC was the Mennonite Central Committee <clears throat> has a small booklet called Supportive Care and the Congregation, which is essentially a group of, of mm -hmm. denomination that took the circles of support model, the circles of friends model, and put it in a theological and denominational setting and as a guidebook for congregations to use around forming a circle of support and care, which doesn't cost any money at all um, to do that. That's all commitment and care at that, at that point. And I really like Gabriel's thing that uh, comment that, you know, you may then, if you're working with an individual, find something that needs some costs, but often people are very willing 
in my experience, to raise money for a specific need that might help one or two people that, that rather than some giving to a general program mm -hmm. um, uh, in that way. And then David Weatherose has a, a model called the star raft model, which comes from a nautical image of boats being safer when they're tied together, mm -hmm. sort of bow to bow in sort of like a star shape with mm -hmm. pedals going out. Uh, that 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 way they much are much are able to sustain through storms and crises uh, boats themselves and you can look up David Weatherow's model uh, on the uh, on the web I think or David if you can put it up in the in the comment chat section we can I can tell people how to get to it great uh, any other uh, questions Well, I would, sorry I didn't get to say thank you to Aaron, but I'll do that by email. Uh, great job. Uh, Gabrielle and Shelly, thank you so much for being part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, we'll be sharing information that it's here. There are some great responses, some great information. Um, and I, it's not uh, unusual that I would, that I say, uh, to other people, oh, I wish some more of us could do something like what J Dame does, uh, and uh, and uh, having that. And the other thing about that is having a month long awareness thing means you don't try to set it for a specific Sunday or Friday or Saturday, and you give people lots of flexibility in terms of how they can respond uh, mm -hmm. to that. So thank you very much. Uh, for your presence today, and we wish you the best as you move into February and to yeah. 2018 J Day month. Uh, we'll hope you'll put out some news about what's going on that we can share with other people. Um, and uh, if you're take a look at the upcoming webinars on the uh, www.faithanddisability.org, uh, there are registration links for all of those. Uh, next month is. Uh, from Connecticut, uh, and Linda Rambler, who works at the Connecticut, you said the university center there has worked along with some congregations in Connecticut where inclusion has just gotten to be a way of business, and so it's nothing special. And we want to kind of, she's going to explore with them how people have, to use your ribbon image, Shelly and Gabriel, have been woven into the life of, of a couple of congregations. Uh, so that it's not uh, not a big deal. Uh, you can also find information about putting faith to work, which Aaron mentioned on the uh, faithanddisability.org website. There are also places on that website for you to enter resources that you have written or developed or articles you have written so that they can be shared more widely. And so, uh, Shelly and Gabrielle and people who you know have written resources and materials that mm -hmm. related to Jewish inclusion and awareness, encourage them to get them up there. We do have a list up there of resources and networks that Shelly put together a couple of years ago in the Jewish community for a webinar, uh, for a session we did at the AUC conference. Um, but uh, for now, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank thanks you. for all of you who attended, and we'll look forward to having you join us at the next at one of the next webinars. Have a good thank day you. and stay warm. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks so much. Bye bye.